Andrews here. I uh, want to uh, kind of just do a reset. I'm Chad Andrews. That's Megan Rich. And we went, we had Chris Murphy, Terry Sirota, and Susan Lackey on earlier. And then we just had the very bright Sade Smith do, we did a presentation on shaping the future of the sport. And she was lights out. Hopefully you got your stretch on. Megan, did you get your stretch on? A little yoga, a little jumping jacks? I did. I did some uh, <coughs> these and, and some of these. Some of the, what, were the, what are these doing? So the, the, like, ah, you're back. The shoulder right. one. I know the answer to that. Okay, well, enough of our shenanigans. Let's bring on, we've already got Megan on, but we are going to be talking about conversations on growing diversity in events through recruiting. So can we drag Reggie into this? Yes, good morning or good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. All right, great. And can you see me as well? Cannot see you as well. You okay, wanna... bear with me for one second here. Not sure what's going on with the video. I was just up. It's okay, no pressure. <laughs> yeah. I can get a few more stretches. Oh, coffee. I forgot. Coffee. There he is. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, Reggie, the floor is yours. Tell us what's going on. <laughs> All right. Well, good, good afternoon and good morning uh, from wherever you are. Um, I'm definitely excited to uh, be part of this uh, diversity summit. Uh, I attended last year and uh, certainly I'm excited to talk to you um, today about uh, diversity in sport and just really around recruiting as well. So thank you uh, first and foremost for having me as one of your, your panelists for this wonderful um, event that you guys are putting on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're we're happy. We're we're the ones that are happy to get to have you on, Megan. How yeah. do you want to start this off with Reggie? Because I'm sure he's got a dearth and a wealth of knowledge that we can get into. For sure. Yeah. Thanks, Chad, and thanks, Reggie. Um, I am so excited that Reggie is here with us today. Um, I have had the fortune of chatting with him a couple times, and I am really excited for the insight that he's going to share with us on breaking through barriers to entry for triathlon and for becoming a coach. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and just turn it over to Reggie. Um, and Reggie, would you mind giving us a bit of background about your experience in multi-sport? Um, and then a little bit of background about your experience as a coach. How did you get started in multi-sport? How did you get started um, as a coach? Yes, absolutely, Megan. So um, again, thank you for having me. So um, for those that don't know me, my name is Reggie Waller. I'm a USAT level one coach. Um, I'm an RRCA uh, running coach as well. And um, I'm a national director for Team Barlow, where we have about 130 um, multi-sport athletes around the globe. Um, I'm a coach of Wolfpack Sports. And then um, I'm also um, a member of uh, Philly Triathlon Club as well. So I have my hands um, in a lot here um, in the multi-sport world. And, you know, I, I, I just love it. Um, you know, um, I've been, you know, married. I just celebrated 16 years with my beautiful wife. And we have an eight-year-old son uh, who actually scored his uh, first uh, goal this afternoon um, at a soccer game. So he was very excited. So a lot of, uh, a lot of excitement today in the Waller household. Um, so to give you a little background about how I got started in multi-sport, right? Um, for me, I've been very familiar with sports in high school I ran track um, but I didn't do it into my junior senior year and I played soccer um, I, I started out you know playing basketball knew I wasn't going to be the next uh, Jordan or Pippen at that time you know I was pretty much riding the bench so I said hey, let me you know try um, try my dad um, over in the, the track and soccer see what I can do there and I wound up running a 400 1800 1600 uh, meter relay and 3200 meter relay and um, actually did fairly well I placed in uh, regionals and states. I went to school in Maryland and then um, didn't run in college. Um, I, I didn't play sports in college and I took a little hiatus. And, you know, I started uh, picking up running again in 2004, you know, when I was uh, just first met my wife. She was actually training for a marathon in Hawaii. And, you know, I was like, well, let me just start running with this girl, see what happens. And then didn't do anything with it there until I got into the workplace and started talking with um, a lot of my, my counterparts that were into more of the longer distance running. And there's this famous run here in uh, Philadelphia. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, outside the greater Philadelphia area and signed up for the Broad Street Run. And my, my buddy Gary said, hey, let's go ahead and do this. 
I signed up on a day of the race. He didn't show up. So I, I trained. So I had to, you know, I had to go and run. And, you know, fast forward 2011, um, you know, I um, really got into the running. And one of my buddies, he was in the CrossFit, um, my buddy Tony. And, you know, he was like, yeah, let's do this triathlon. So I signed up and I, I you know, started training. And I'm like, okay, so you, you're you going to be there for the race, right? He, he didn't show up. So, you know, I'm sitting there swimming, you know, doing a swim, bike run by myself. And I, I, I loved it. And I knew I wasn't Michael Phelps coming out of the water. Um, once I got done, and this was like a nice introduction um, into the sport because it was in a pool at the, the local Y here. And, you know, um, you know, brand new to sport. I don't come from a swimming background. So I said, okay, you know what? I'll get in. I'll survive. Did a couple laps back and forth. It was about 500 meters. So I had to hang on to the side a little bit, came back. And after the whole race was done, asked my wife, how did I do? First thing she said, you need to work on your swim. <laughs> you know, and I, I love her to this day. I mean, she's my toughest critic, but she's always, you know, my, my biggest cheerleader as well. And you'll probably hear some things that, you know, where I've gotten myself into uh, during some of these longer races, you know, because she's a big supporter. She's like, hey, go ahead and do it. And, you know, I, I say that to say, um, you know, Megan and Chat, you know, I, you know, I, I went out and did it. Was it perfect? No. Did I survive? Yes. Were there people out there that looked like me? No. But I went out and I represented. I, I always tell my son, finish what you start, go out and give your best foot forward. And I'll, I'll share a couple of stories with you where I went from actually um, short course racing to failing because I moved up a little bit too quick to DNF to then shortly after uh, completing my first um, half Ironman to my first full Ironman and, um, you know, still in the sport, uh, what is it, 10 years later. Wow, that's that's an impressive background. It, it, it's funny that there's been a trend here today, and I'm not trying to divin it about the whole water thing. It's like everybody seems like the water is the one thing that everybody's like, oh, no, I don't want to do it. But the fact that you, pers you, you pushed your own personal comfort boundaries to make it happen, why, why, why do you, why are you carrying this torch as a coach and a, a triathlete to, to really show some diversity in our sport? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think about looking at some of the um, elite athletes in the, in the field, you know, um, not everybody knows Andy Potts, you know, um, former Olympian swimmer, um, you know, very quick. And, you know, he can come first out of the water, but sometimes depending on the race, he's not the one that's going to be winning the race. You know, he, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for um, Andy Potts and those pros. A lot goes into that. So it's about balance. You know, it's like you can't be the fastest out of the water because you still got the bike and the run. And, you know, I started to notice, you know, in my soundtrack to um, athletes and just people looking to get into sport is, hey, you can, you know, you can do this too. But I had to realize no, I had to, um, I had to kind of break that down and tell them what that really meant. You know, it's, it's work that goes into this, and it's not just like because I got past the swim that you can do this. You know, what people don't see is the countless hours that go in behind the scenes. Um, you know, as a working um, father, parent, um, my training, I don't get to wake up early in the morning and say, okay, I'm going to spend a couple hours of training or what have you. My training you know, since this 2010 period or 2011 period, excuse me, has been at night. So my training kicks in at 8.30 at night. And, you know, when I'm done, I'm going to bed at 11 o'clock and kind of starting my day. And, you know, that's what I have to remind people that it's not going to be, um, you know, pretty much clear and exact as far as your plan. So when I looked at it from a coaching standpoint, I have to look at each of my athletes very differently. Each of them has a set of needs that are going to be different and i can't expect to coach all of those athletes the same way so i have some that like to do their morning um, their workouts early in the morning um, i can give them um, i can prescribe them uh, specific uh, workouts and then they will go on do that and um, be on their way there are some to where they like to communicate before during and after the workout and, you know, that's great. I, I'm um, coaching an athlete who's a project manager, so he's very meticulous. Like, he loves the details. So we always talk about, um, you know, what's happening. So I, I, I love Rick for that because now he makes me more um, grounded. I have to break things down, and we have conversations about 
what it is that I'm looking for him to get out of the workout. And then once it's done, we talk about in detail how that went. Now, are all my athletes like that? Again, no, but it's an opportunity to look at each of those individuals differently. Yeah, Reggie, you touched on something that I I think is super interesting um, with having to train in the evenings that can create a barrier or having to train early in the morning. So what are some of the barriers that maybe you've overcome as an athlete? Um, and then maybe some examples of barriers that you've experienced some of your athletes hitting um, that you're coaching, possibly give us some ideas of what other coaches could look out for in terms of the barriers that your athletes are, are hitting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the barriers that I hit, I, I, I kind of talked about this as um, um, earlier on is that, that DNF, you know, so I was doing some um, uh, sprint triathlons um, in the Philly area, swimming in school kill. And then I jumped up and said, hey, you know what, it was uh, June 2014. I remember it to this date. Um, you know, my son was a year old and, you know, took a little bit of time off training, got back in the pool. And I was like, yeah, I can jump up to the Olympic distance. And when I got there, um, you know, I was sitting on the side, didn't belong to a club. And I saw other people that had that camaraderie with, um, you know, uh, friends, peers, family, whatever the case may be. So with, you know, us having a young child, my wife was at home, normally she comes to the races. And I remember sitting there on the side of the school field, just looking. And once I got in the water, you know, I, I didn't even get 50 meters and I'm sitting there raising my hand and I, I got on, the, you know, the lifeguard asked me, Hey, are you good? Um, I said, yes. So I got on the boat and then, um, I, I took, you know, the, um, the ride of shame back to, um, to, to the shore. And I remember picking all my stuff up and I talked to the person in transition and I said, Hey, you know what? I need to, um, get out of here. Um, can I, you know, can I just get my stuff and go? And she said, yeah, hurry up and make it quick. And I remember getting on my on the phone. I told my wife, I'm done. This is it. I'm done. Um, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like it. I picked up all my stuff and I felt like a, a little kid. I didn't want to play anymore. And she's like, okay, just get your stuff. Let's come back home. And, you know, I, I think that barrier for me was not having that team camaraderie. And, you know, after I kind of settled down, you'll see my wife was kind of like that calming point for me. You know, but then she'll get me riled up and then get ready to go for another race. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, winded up finding Philly Triathlon Club here in, in Philly, and that was like my saving grace. That was that camaraderie that I was able to uh, build that friendship. And that's what I tell my athletes is, you know, you got to find that team. Some some people don't like being part of big teams, or you got to find that team that's right for you because some can be kind of cliquish, some some can be very competitive, and that's where I, I remind my athletes is, you know, you have to have that teamwork because, you know, for me training late at night, sometimes, you know, I was going to the pool by myself, but I knew if I pinged one of my teammates that, you know, I would get a little bit of encouragement to say, Hey, you know, great job. Or I'm posting something on social media and, you know, people would say, Hey, great job with the workout. Oh, by the way, you motivated me to go on and do X, Y, and Z. So I think if I didn't have that, um, club camaraderie um you know i got uh i guess you know you can call it suckered into uh signing up for uh, a full iron man and again you know this was the best thing that happened to me because when i look in um, look at sport i don't see a lot of uh, black triathletes like myself and it's very lonely sometimes i'm not gonna lie but you know and it feels like sometimes when you're doing this you're kind of in it by yourself and for me some of the things um from um, in the workplace roles that i've had i've always been that only individual that looked like myself in the room of maybe say 30 40 people so you take that from being in the the the, the office space to being into triathlon for me it was very transferable but i had to think about how can i translate that into working with athletes and you know, helping get more athletes into sport and being that role model. So then that way they, they too can see that this is a sport for everybody and not just one. So I, I think, you know, being part of that club experience got me into completing my first half Ironman in 2016. And then a month later, I was able to then complete that, um, that full, um, Ironman in Lake Placid. So it was, uh, definitely uh you know a great opportunity i think you touched on something 
really interesting um, in terms of like the community and the magic that is being part of a club or a team. Um, do you have any suggestions on how a coach can take and create that community or club environment so that their athletes feel like they're welcome? Um, so that you have athletes from all different backgrounds, skill levels, um, so that they can have that group of people that make them feel like they want to keep going and keep being a part of the part of the training and part of racing. Yeah, absolutely. The, the one thing that comes to mind was, um, you know, understanding my why for posting on social media. So if you look at my social media account at RunnerDude73, you know, I, I don't have a big following and, you know, I was trying, it was first private and then I went um, public as I started doing more stuff um, as team director with Barlow. And, you know, there I was like, okay, well, what's my purpose? Why am I posting on social media? And I would get messages from my workouts saying, hey, good job, you know, keep this up. You've motivated me to do X, Y, and Z. And this is from people from all around the globe. And I remember there was one particular situation, uh, individuals now an athlete of mine and a good friend, um, and he's a captain of Black Men Run, Theo Sample. And, you know, I remember during the pandemic, um, Iron Man had that virtual uh, racing series. And, he, you know, I was, you know, posting, indicating, hey, this is what I'm doing. And he would reach out to me and was asking questions and he would continue to ask questions. And, you know, I found myself um, then connecting with him. And in the fast forward, um, during the winter time, what we did was he um, he included me in this uh, WhatsApp uh, group chat. And I'm like, well, why is he adding me to this group chat? What is this? You know, long behold, I was on there with other captains from Black Men Run from around the US. So there were about, um, I wanna say about 13 of us in this group. And where I found myself was talking to them about Zwift and getting into multi-sport and getting into indoor riding. So next thing you know, they were asking me questions about Zwift. How do I go about um, creating a a group ride? So I was teaching them to how to create these these forums to then go off and then um, create these forums with their network of uh, individuals. And it's just been incredible, you know, thinking about Black Men Run, you just have a group of runners know what I found where there were other athletes, um, there were all other multi-sport athletes in that forum. So again, if I had to stop posting on social media because I wasn't sure my purpose, my goal was just to really reach one person, make an impact, I would tell other coaches, you know, continue to post your workouts um, with your athletes on social media, continue to um, talk about some of the um, barriers that you have around coaching or some of the things, um, some of the breakthroughs some of your athletes have had um, in training and in racing. And you'll be surprised. You know, you just that one person that you touch makes a big difference. And then they're going off and telling, you know, their friends and other athletes. And that's how I got into coaching Theo into a PR um, at his uh, duathlon um, over in Jersey in August. You know, we formed that relationship, we started running together, we started riding virtually, then I coached him, um, and then he showed up at his um, duathlon um, in Atlantic City. And, you know, now he's telling his friends and, you know, they see uh, what he's capable of. So it's just that trickle down effect and sharing those good moments, but don't don't just always share the good, always share the, um, the, the challenges as well. I sense a little undertone of accountability with the social media and the friends and everything like that. That's, that's pretty powerful. Even though you, you know, you took your toys and ran one time, it's you've, you've learned and you've, you've developed into not only a a, a competent athlete, but a a great coach. So walk me through this. Here's a question that I have for you. I'm going to play out a scenario In, in Charlotte, where I live, there's a, there's a great group of women that ride together of all different ethnicities. And it's just so great. Um, but there's a there's been a renaissance of triathletes and cyclists coming from the NBA, from NASCAR, from the NFL. I like Reggie Miller from TNT. You know he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He's riding the bike now and doing a little bit of running. There there is one scenario, and this is where I'm going with this. I'm going to tie it all back in. I was emceeing the Hincapie Grand Fondo, and they had all these world tour riders all still stick in. Everybody's all. You know, it's fun and games in the front row, but we have a top athlete. D'Angelo Williams, he played for the Carolina Panthers and the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's become a triathlete and a cyclist. 
and I on the microphone, I literally got him and I pulled him up to the front row, did an interview with him, and he looked me dead in the eyes and he said, I want to go back because I don't belong up here. What would you say to somebody like that? You belong. You belong up there. You know, you've earned your spot. And um, with triathlon, it's, you know, one, there's all different shapes and sizes. So where, where, I, where I would like to say is when I look at triathlon, you know, I'm 6'2". I'm um, about 195. I remember when I was in the 211 um, weight class and I was just like, oh, you know, I, I, I can't be there because I, you know, don't have good races at that weight. Never been that, that heavy. And, you know, people think with, with triathlon, you have to be a certain weight, a certain size, a certain race. And when I look around, you know, I've gotten my butt kicked by people heavier than me. Uh, I've gotten my butt kicked by people that were older than me. And, you know, I've, you know, I've earned that spot. So I would say to that individual that was at the Grand Fondo, you know, you, um, you are there, you are you, and, you know, you own that space. Um, you know, just because you don't look like everybody else, you're setting the stage for other people to come in to say, wow, I can be part of this as well. And, you know, I, I you know, want to do my part. I'm continuing to do my part. I coach a youth group um, in Philly. So I sit on the board of the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia, where we promote bike safety and efficacy. And we have a youth cycling team. And that um, we have, and we have a triathlon team as well. And they're 12 to 18. And when I showed up, you know, I was talking about all these things about Ironman, this, that, and the other, and they had no clue at all. So I realized that I had to, you know, go and break things down for them to say they knew how to bike very well, right? So now it's just like, well, how do I get them to swim and run? Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we didn't have access to a pool. And I said, well, we're not going to shut the season down. We got to do something. Multi-sport is not just triathlon. You have aqua bike. You have um, duathlon, so I work with the team, and we we did a duathlon, and we um, it was an official um, USAT registered event, but we gave them a good experience. And I mean, you know, Megan and Chad, I wish you could have seen the smiles on those kids' faces when we were done. And you know, that right there was very, it, it was it was a better experience than you know receiving that medal when I crossed the line uh, for my full Ironman. Because here I'm, I'm giving um, these youth an opportunity to experience the sport and, you know, allowing them to access something different. We volunteered at a women's duathlon in Philly. They were handing out medals. I had a few friends that, um, female friends that placed um, um, in the, the top 10. And they were able to see some of these women and be introduced to them and just see that they too can be part of this multi-sport uh, multi experience. Reggie, that brings up a really great point that's been kind of a trend um, today is the representation piece. Could you touch on how important representation is um, in terms of seeing other athletes who look like you or on this on the same uh, note and almost even more impactful is having a coach that looks like you. So the impact that you're able to have as a black coach on young black athletes how important is that in creating sustainable growth in terms of diversity? Yeah, absolutely. And I was, I've, I've been thinking about this all the time. So I know Max Fennell, we've exchanged, um, you know, quite a few DMs through social media. I remember meeting Sika Henry um, at Eagle Man when we raced that together in 2018. And I had been following her, um, you know, before the race. And then I saw her, and this was before she was pro. And, you know, I was like, oh, that's Sika. And I was like, you know, me, I'm an introvert. And, you know, I was like, again, you know, not a big social media following, like, well, no, I don't want to bother her. You know, we're both racing. And I'm glad I stepped up to Sika that day and just introduced myself. We, you know, still exchange DMs. And I love what she's doing in the community. I love what Max has done in the community. And, you know, to see, you know, Sika get her pro card, you know, everybody was cheering for her. And, you know, it's, it's saddening to see those are I mean, it's good to see those are my role models, right? But where I say that I'm sad is there's only two in the sport. And when I look at coaches, you know, I think about, um, you know, Coach Marcus Fitz, um, you know, and then you have, uh, you know, Coach Hannah, who I saw when I was racing AC this past September. So, you know, again, when I look up to see athletes or coaches, they're, you know, 
there are very few that look like me. So for me, it's important. Can I wave my, you know, magic triathlon wand and say, okay, where everything is going to be equal across the field? No, but it's starting to have those uncomfortable conversations one person at a time. Um, and um, it's, you know, again, just talking with people. And when you have the conversation, it's, it's very interesting that how this journey has evolved for me just by telling people what it was I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. And, you know, now my mentor coach, uh, Justin Trule, who's out in Colorado Springs, uh, we met um, uh, back um, in the June timeframe. And I'm very thankful for him and his mentorship in this space and uh, him and I are going to actually meet in person next month. Um, I'm going to be headed out to Colorado Springs for my level two certification, for, um, which I'm very excited about. So again, when you start sharing and telling people that story about where you want to go or um, what it would be nice to see in sport, you know, you'll you'll be surprised at how many supporters there are. There are going to be some naysayers. I'm not going to you know sugarcoat it and say, hey, I, I've seen some of the. Um, comments that uh Sika receives on her post you know being at first um female black triathlete and it's it's very disheartening that we still live in that um, society today where people are that hurtful by their comments and try to hide behind those um and don't want that um inclusion yeah um you oh, yeah you a uh, huge max and Sika fan i think what they've done for this sport is incredible um, Sika becoming the first black female professional triathlete this year was probably the highlight of the year. I'm so pumped for her. She's an incredible person. Um, you mentioned mentorship. Can you talk a little bit about how your mentor, how the mentorship with Justin um, Trulo, how important that was for you? And, and give me tips you have on finding a mentor. If, if someone's out there looking for a mentor, how could they go about finding one? Yeah, absolutely. So in the coach space, you know, I, I think, you know, it, there's definitely need for mentorship, you know, so there was a recent article in HPR about, um, you know, you can be a mentor, but, you know, really people of color, women need advocates to say, I want Reggie Waller at the table versus, oh, I'm going to train Reggie to be a better coach. No, in order for you to get to a certain point, you need that advocacy. And, you know, I, I think working with, um, you know, Justin, it's been it's, it's been great where we need to see more of that in the coaching space. And that's what I would like to be able to do is have a seat at the table and, you know, be able to, one, have other coaches see somebody that look like them. And, um, you know, the, the first step is just asking. You know, I gave you my social media at WinnerDo73 if you're interested in coaching. Uh, one of my colleagues, or not colleagues, uh, track leads um, in Delaware, Greg, had reached out and we talked about it. And he had a friend that was um, a USAT coach. And, you know, we got him linked up. And I believe he's going to be going through the program very shortly. So, again, it's just, uh, you know, if you see somebody in the industry, you know, just ask, have the conversation with them. My personal coach that, um, that I use for the athlete side of training um, for myself personally, Todd Wiley, great former pro um you know i asked questions he would provide me with answers and you know he was the one that gave me a good experience to where it was like hmm, you know what i think i can do this you know i can do this coaching and i encourage people just if you see somebody ask um you see somebody that's doing well emulate them um and you'll be surprised again at who is willing to have that conversation it just starts with a simple ask and if they're not willing to help then kind of move on because not everybody's willing to help as well or have the resources. Um, so, you know, you can reach out to me. I'm more than willing to sit down and have a conversation with you more about my experience. Reggie, I, I, I'm sorry. I, this is something that just clocked into my brain, Megan. H how long have you been competing well, from day one? How many years? So, so uh, 2008. Um, running from a competitive standpoint in long distance and in triathlon, um, short course, uh, 2011. So we're okay, looking so at uh, triathlon 10 years. So let's take 10 years. And from a coaching standpoint, this is the way my mind works. And I think this will help everybody. 10 years ago today, what would you have said would be a success and look at yourself now? And then let's take today and go 10 years and hope where diversity 
and your own personal experience in the sport happens. So 10 years ago today, look how far you have come. Would you have been impressed, happy? And today, moving forward 10 years, what are your expectations? So 10 years ago, uh, looking back, I would say I'm, I'm impressed. You know, I didn't, um, I didn't give up. Um, I remember saying I can't a couple of times and in that I can't came into I did and, and you know took that and showed other individuals how they could do also uh, where I'm at now please but there's still more room to grow um, so I look back or right, I'm looking forward 10 years and what I would like to see is Reggie Waller level three coach uh, with USA triathlon um, a part of the coaching committee working to grow and get more um, people of color coaches and triathlete uh, uh, multi-sport athletes into this space you know so um, double tripling the number of pros as well as the number of triathletes in this space I like that that's yeah it's a great a great 10 years I I, I love that Reggie um, one thing that I would love more thoughts on is you mentioned being an advocate um, so I know there's a lot of people on the webinar today who, you know, that's what they want to do is be an advocate um, for people in multi-sport, getting into multi-sport, people who are not here yet that we want to have here. What are some um, ways that people can be advocates? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, looking at it, if you know people of color in the, the multi-sport community and opportunities opportunities come up all the time, whether it's volunteering or what have you, mention those names to individuals that have power of influence. Um, it goes a long way. Don't mentor the person to eventually get that job. If you know they're doing something already, throw, you know, ask them, hey, can I throw your name in the hat for this opportunity? You know, that's, um, and then and taking that to the next step and then going to that um, organization or that um, event, whatever, and saying, I have this individual um, and I know that they will do fine and, you know, being that voice for them and getting them a seat at the table. Um, that goes a long way. So the more we can do more of that, you know, then that is going to have an impactful statement in the community. You know, so again, we all do a lot of mentorship, you know, how to, you know, get people polished and how to make people better athletes but you know until we can put them in that seat of leadership or um that seat of influence um we all have a voice and I, I think we need to start doing more of that all right so we had Sade on and what Sade was talking about is one of the biggest challenges is a barrier would be a pool and a bike how in Philly and mid-Atlantic is there an initiative up there to to have access to these kind of assets or is it something that's still a work in progress you know with the pools the public pools that's where we had a struggle with um the the youth coalition um or the youth cycling team getting them access to um a, a public pool so i think work is still underway in philadelphia to get more access to pools because you think about it um you know where i belong um la fitness um it's a monthly membership $39 and I can go in and get access to the pool uh, there are different um, initiatives um, again where there is bike collection and you can get bikes for um, you know half the cost but again you know you can have a bike but if it's not fitted correctly or if it's not um, the, the right type of bike for you you're in the sport but it's not equality we were not on this, um, the equal playing field so I, I think not just in Philadelphia, but more broadly, we need to um, talk about more access related to pools uh, and also bikes. Um, but you know, you mentioned that you, a good point is when I look at it more holistically, the sport of triathlon. So I know m my wife debates this. She's a finance person. She has an MBA in finance, so she's the numbers person. And you know, we we talk about this all the time. Is you know, she reminds me, triathlon is an expensive sport. And if you think about it, it is. Um, you know, doing a sprint triathlon maybe gets you around the $3,000 mark for an entry-level bike. But thinking about all the fees um, and um, the cost associated with it. But if you're looking to go into long sport, 
you know, you could be almost looking upwards to thirty, forty thousand dollars because of bikes, um, the amount of training, um, access to pools. But then also, what people don't think about is access to a coach to keep you grounded, and then you know, proper nutrition, and then also, um, you know, you think about it, uh, massage therapy, so that way your body heals a little quicker to keep you going a little bit longer. So that that whole health piece uh, with the food and the physical health adds into it. So there's a lot that goes that needs to be unpacked as it relates to tri triathlon. So it's, um, you know, again, access to pools, but then also um, bikes, but then the, the, the big picture, the, the financial cost of it. We have a question from one of our attendees, Marcel Paulser. Marcel, I hope I got that right. You can thumbs up or thumbs down me. His question is, what's the biggest challenge you face when you are recruiting athletes as a coach? I would say it, it's uh, two things, cost and, and credibility. Um, you know, they're looking at, okay, what, um, how can you get them to the, the finish line? What are your credentials? Um, and what makes you much more different um, than the other coaches that are out there. And then it comes down to cost as well. Uh, I was talking to uh, one of my buddies who's um, racing. Uh, he's a race director with USAT, and he's racing this weekend in Florida. Um, you know, we were talking about cost of a coach. He's paying $99 for a coach. Um, I know there are other coaches that range from uh, $300 um, per month for coaching. So again, um, I, I think it's uh, really, uh, you know, one, your, uh, your, your style, your level of philosophy as a coach. And then it's also um, the challenges that I run with is uh, cost. Um, I would like to think sometimes with me being African American and not, and, and being an age group athlete and not a professional, I think that can hinder me sometimes as well. Uh, but I know that I'm not a coach for everybody. Um, I'm, you know, I'm working with age group athletes and, you know, I want to work with individuals that want to get involved in the sport. One thing I want to add to that too, I think that's very intriguing with, with my coaching business. When, when I almost look at like a conversation and maybe you can dovetail off of this is that the athlete is interviewing you as much as you are interviewing the athlete to see if there's a fit. Do you find that to be helpful for you as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, because I don't want to take somebody's money and then, you know, it's not um, a, a good relationship. So I have an intake process to where um, I'm, you know, using a set of questions to understand about them first. And then we get on a, um, a Zoom call or on the phone or in person. And, you know, perfect example was uh, was Rick. Um, you know, my athlete, Rick, he's local. He found me on USAT when we did the refresh of the website. So thank you very much, USAT. Good job with the website and um, being able to promote me out there. And he said, hey, I found your, um, you know, your uh, uh, profile on the website. Uh, we met at a local Starbucks and I was a little hesitant about meeting in person. You know, so we talked on the phone for about a half hour and he said, well, I want to go ahead and meet you in person. Um, so we met at the local Starbucks and then my wife texted me. She was like, hey, is everything okay? Um, you know, and, uh, you know, you've been going about an hour and a half now. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm still here talking with Rick. And I would say it was the great, it, it was the greatest experience because we, you know, we were both interviewing at, um, each other at that time to understand, is this going to be a relationship that works? You know, if I come, you know, if I have somebody come to me to say, hey, I want to be, um, you know, top five pro triathlete in the world and I'm starting from zero to wanting to go there. <sighs> I'm like, hey, you know what? Mm, I'm I'm not your coach. I don't want to take your money. I don't want to disappoint you. That's something that um, I can't do right now. But you know what? I have a portfolio of coaches that I can reach out to and maybe get you somebody that can help target your specific needs. So you you know, again, Chad, you're right. It is um, really a, a relationship. It's like dating. You know, uh, you know, you gotta ask questions on both ends to make sure you're both getting uh, what you're looking for out of the relationship. I, uh, just to go off something, I think that's a, an amazing point you made. And I know, Megan, we have another question that you're going to pose there. But some of the best coaches in the world were never professional athletes. So there are great professional athletes that are coaches out there, but there are also coaches that study the sport. And you sound like you're somebody who absolutely studies the sport. So that's, a, that's just something I wanted to chime in there before 
before Megan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just to add there, and I, I want to get to Megan's question as well. No, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner in this, and I have tons of books in my uh, my library, and I, I, sh I shared my library with Justin the other day because um, after one of our one-on-one -on -one sessions, I, I said, hey, I got this book on periodization, and um, I just want to let you know because I was bragging, like, hey, look, you know, I'm adding my, my library. And no, for me, I'm, you know, um, you can be either a, a, a theorist or you can actually go out and, you know, be a, a practitioner. And that's that's me. I'm going to read the books, you know, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm going to read, understand the sport, but then I'm also going to go out and apply it as well and learn, you know, hands on experience. Sorry, Megan, I, I know you have a question over there. That's so awesome. Totally good. So the question, um, it's an actual, it's a question from an attendee and it is about how to access um, athletes from underserved or underrepresented demographics who are not aware of the sport of triathlon. So do you have any um, advice for coaches who are looking to tap into communities where triathlon is currently not present, um, how they can reach those individuals and kind of give them uh, insight into what triathlon, triathlon is and inspire them to participate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I look at the running community. The, the running community is, is kind of like the, um, the, the home base there for um, individuals to get exposure into multi-sport. Um, you know, some people are saying, hey, you know what, I, you know, I like the 5K or I like the marathon, but I want to do something different. You know, if you, um, so where I would say is, you know, start with your local running, uh, running shop and uh, throw a seminar on there um, to talk about multi-sport. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned with um, Black Men Run, you know, I started working with them there and, you know, I was, I was amazed at how many black men were part of the multi-sport community and you know you just start sharing that message there's black girls run so there are um you know you can go to your local ymca and i believe it's usa triathlon they um have some materials to where you can put together um a short swim bike run with your local y that's a great starting point right there to one as a coach showcase your skills put the put a program together for those that are looking to participate but then also um, give those that may not want to participate an opportunity to come in on that day, look, experience, and see, wow, this is, um, this is what the sport is all about. I, I think it's you know, really starting local and then growing a little bit more organically. Yeah, that's awesome, Reggie. And just to, to add, USAT does have programs um, that you can implement at a YMCA pretty easily, um, really any kind of fitness club. Um, we have an indoor multi-sport program as well as a splash and dash program that's geared towards kids. Both of these both of these events you can do without any training. It's a good intro to the sport. Um, so more information on those two programs can be found on our website. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Yeah. yeah, I just love um, you know how the sport is starting to grow. And um, I, I think it's um, Ish Sullins. I, I might be getting her last name mixed up. Um, a young lady who, um, you know, has been competing in triathlons, um, African-American or black young female. And, um, you know, Sika shared an article on her Facebook page the other day. And, you know, as um, Ish was talking about uh, sport and who she looks up to, she was like, hey, I'm glad to see Sika Henry, um, you know, racing. And I remember Sika, you know, she, you know, she almost threw in the towel after that, that, that nasty crash. And I remember seeing and hearing about that. And I'm just like, my heart just dropped. And I'm like, wow. You know, so you hear like a trend of, you know, when I got that DNF, you know, I almost stopped. I said, I'm, I'm almost done. And I said, no, I, I, I can't. Um, I have to go on and continue. You know, I love that Sika did the same thing after that crash. You know, it does mess with your mental game there. It's it, This sport is a mental um, sport as well. So I'm glad Sika, you know, stepped back in, got her pro card. And, you know, we're, we're both, again, looking to be role models in the community um, to help grow the sport, you know, really one athlete at a time. And it really starts with the, the youth that are looking up to us. Um, when we look at um, media, and this may have been played out um, in a, a prior conversation, but when you look at um, media showing triathlon, you really don't see it on, um, on TV. I remember when I was training for my um, my race in 2016 and I told my brother-in-law my bike was in the shop he was thinking I was going to Kona because that's what everybody knows is the NBC Kona on TV and I said no that's 
that's the Super Bowl. You got to qualify for that. So I think as the sport can be more televised at the local level, I think um, PTO is doing a good job where they're um, starting to publicize or um, televise more of these races, you know, then that opens up to a broader audience there and not just the um, Iron Man Kona that you always see where it's just the, you know, the 2,500 uh, top finishers from all the races. Oh, such good stuff, uh, Reggie. We, we we can't thank you enough for, for joining us on this Saturday, taking away from your coaching, your family, and your training. Uh, that was very, very big of you to take your time. Um, but we are going to take a lunch break. Uh, Reggie, we hope that you come back and watch the rest of the show. Oh, one thing. Can we do me a favor and bring back the Philly bike race? I miss working that. We got to have, yes, yes. <laughs> have the bike race back. But um, if uh, what's your what's your social handle if anybody wants to reach out to you? Yes, at RunnerDude73 on Instagram. And then for those in the Philly area, I'll be speaking again tomorrow on the same topic at the Philly Bike Expo. So, Chad, wish you were here in Philly. Uh, so there's a bike expo that's happening um, uh, down at the convention center. Well, great. Well, listen, have a great rest of your afternoon, and we really appreciate your time. All right, Megan, Chad, thank you. And, and thank you, um, participants, as well. All right, guys, we're going to take a break. We'll be back at 2 o'clock Mountain Time, 4 o'clock Eastern Time. And if you're in London, 10 o'clock? I don't know. Anyway, was that right? Was my math right? Is my North Carolina education failing me? <laughs>